Limerence is an altered mental state of obsessive romantic infatuation. It's an intense and irresistible desire for another person that really does feel like an addiction. Naturally enough, that raises the question of whether limerence is itself a mental health condition. Alternatively, are there other mental health conditions that might contribute to limerence? Now, I actually get asked this question a lot. Is there some connection between limerence and obsessive compulsive disorder or ADHD or bipolar disorder or anxious attachment or erotomania or personality disorders and so on. It's a good question uh, and I think the answer is no. I don't think that limerence is caused by any of these other conditions but there are some intriguing overlaps and parallels that are worth exploring. In this video, I'm going to explain the neuroscience of three of the most significant cases, so ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder and attachment disorders, and how they relate to limerence. Hi, my name is Tom Bellamy. I'm a neuroscientist and a writer, and I blog all about limerence at livingwithlimerence.com. I'm also the author of the book Smitten that explains how neuroscience can help us make sense of obsessive infatuation and to recover from it. Right, let's go through the evidence for how limerence is linked to other mental health conditions. An important place to start is with definitions. So what do I mean by a mental health condition? Well, there are some formal guidelines on this. So things like the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in the US, or the World Health Organization guidelines do specify what are widely agreed upon psychiatric disorders. Now, limerence does not appear in any of those authoritative texts, so it isn't recognized as a psychiatric condition as such. But there is a big grey area in clinical practice for experiences that cause psychological distress. So most therapists and professionals have a kind of working definition that if a substance or a behaviour or a belief is having a severe negative impact on an individual's ability to enjoy their life, then it's a potential problem that needs treatment. And I think limerence fits into this broad category of problems much more readily. So limerence, when it has become severe, so when it's progressed to the point of being a fixation that's causing psychological distress, has a number of, of common symptoms. So things like obsession and mood instability, uh, intrusive thoughts, impulsivity, cravings, compulsive behaviours, impaired judgment, uh, irrational urges, and generally a sense that it's an involuntary drive. So clearly some of those symptoms are shared with other mental health conditions like OCD, ADHD, and anxious attachment. All of these psychological issues are going to arise from common systems in the brain that regulate our key emotions and behaviours. So we could paint a very broad brush picture of the brain, which is rather crude, by separating it into three levels. At the lowest level is the brainstem, and the brainstem has clusters of cells that release some of the neurotransmitters that regulate our fundamental drives. So dopamine for reward and motivation, noradrenaline for arousal, serotonin, which regulates well, actually almost everything. It regulates sleep, it regulates feeding, it regulates sexual activity, it regulates mood. Really, serotonin regulates a lot of different processes within the brain. Now, the next level up, is what could be called the subcortical region. So this includes the basal ganglia, which is the striatum and some other structures that are involved in uh, habitual behavior and reward processing, and the limbic system, which regulates and processes emotions. And finally, on top, the top level of the brain, if you like, in this simple model, is the cortex, which is the decision-making, the executive part of the brain. So that's the region that provides important regulatory feedback to those behavioural drives and those emotions and helps us understand them and put them in a proper context and moderate some of those drives. Now we can break this down into a diagram to help illustrate the point that communication between these fundamental levels of the brain 
is at the heart of many of these mental health conditions that we're discussing. Release of transmitters from those brainstem areas act upwards to the subcortical region, so areas like the amygdala, the striatum, the thalamus, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, the cingulate cortex, and so on, so those subcortical regions. And those regions signal up in turn to the cortex, particularly the prefrontal cortex when it comes to regulation of emotion and behavior. And the subcortical regions receive feedback from the cortex that should determine the appropriate response to whatever has caused arousal or reward seeking or threat detection. But things aren't quite this simple, of course. In fact, those brainstem regions can signal all the way up to the cortex directly and be controlled in their turn by the cortex. And all the subcortical regions can signal down as well to the brainstem. And of course, all those different regions within the limbic system and within the basal ganglia can communicate amongst themselves. So there's a huge medley of communication going on. Now, because these core neural systems regulate all of our emotions and many of our uh, behavioral drives, it's inevitable that there will be some overlap in different mental health conditions. And there's going to be there's two major factors that determine how our brains develop. So the first is our genetics. So that's the heritable part of a, say, a mental health condition. So our genes are going to code for the molecules that regulate the basic functions of the brain. So the receptors and the transporters and the directional cues that help our, our uh, dopamine neurons develop and wire themselves into the basal ganglia, into the cortex and so on. The second major factor is environmental. So this is both the physical environment and the social environment that we grow up within. So the brains are, our brains are continually taking in information from our environment through our sensory neurons, through our eyes and our ears and our nose and our touch and so on. And that information helps determine how the brain connects and how the systems develop. So the connectivity of the brain and the feedback regulation of the different systems depends on that environmental feedback. And as this process continues, the combination of genes and environment are going to lead to particular sensitivities within those systems and also potentially instabilities where the systems aren't operating within the usual parameters that we would like. And this can drive us into states that could be recognized as a mental health condition. So going back to limerence, if we think about the features of limerence, it's things like uh, an intense reward that's linked to a specific person. So the initial euphoria and that intense pleasurable arousal of being with them. So we're thinking about the reward system and the bonding systems and the arousal systems and their stabilities and their sensitivities. From an environmental perspective, if there's the presence of uncertainty or barriers that prevent you from being able to get uh, reliable contact with your limit object and form a healthy bond, that can disrupt the reward-seeking drive and push it into a state of fixation or a state of addiction. Okay, so if we break this down and do a direct comparison between limerence and the other conditions, it helps illustrate some of the similarities and differences. So for limerence, the primary symptoms is really that irresistible wanting, the obsessive thoughts about your limerent object and the, the desire to seek them. And that system instability within the brain is really about excessive reward seeking. So like a behavioral addiction, it's a relentless desire to seek the reward that becomes unregulated. The principal subcortical brain region regulating limerence is going to therefore be the striatum, particularly the nucleus accumbens at the bottom edge of the striatum. And the primary neurotransmitter involved is going to be dopamine, but with some contribution from noradrenaline as well. But now let's think about how those symptoms of limerence might map onto other mental health conditions. So to start, let's begin with obsessive compulsive disorder. So there's a couple of very obvious parallels here. Obsession and obtrusive thoughts. There are common symptoms to both limerence and OCD. But there's an important distinction. So for OCD, the intrusive thoughts tend to be fear-based. So it's about a threat detection problem. 
the anxiety is centered about things like cleanliness or orderliness or security. So here the issue is really with feedback from the executive brain providing the context to that fear. Now people that suffer from OCD also have tend to have compulsive rituals, a repetitive behavior that helps to temporarily calm the anxiety. So it would be things like checking a door is locked a, a particular number of times or washing your hands a particular number of times, things like that. To compare OCD to limerence, the primary symptoms here are actually obsessive fears and compulsive rituals. And that reflects the fact that the system instability is really not about reward seeking now, it's about excessive fear or anxiety and the failure to manage those symptoms. The key subcortical regions involved for OCD seem to be the cingulate cortex and the thalamus and feedback from the orbitofrontal cortex to those different brain regions. There's others that have been implicated as well, but those seem to be the primary areas. And the primary transmitters involved appear to be glutamate and GABA, so different from the neurotransmitters that we've considered so far. Okay, a second uh, condition that's often talked about is ADHD. Now here the symptoms that are common with limerence are things like impulsivity, but again intrusive thoughts, uh, obsessions. But for ADHD, there's other symptoms as well. So the primary symptoms now are the impulsivity, distractibility, hyperactivity. So again, not about excessive wanting. So ADHD seems to arise from um, a failure to properly regulate arousal and motivation systems. And that gives a kind of restlessness, almost excessive positive arousal. The subcortical brain regions involved, so the striatum, there's overlap there, although the motor regions of the dorsal striatum seem to be involved in ADHD as well. There also seems to be another important circuit to the cerebellum, a different brain region again that's involved in motor coordination for the hyperactivity aspects of ADHD. And the primary transmitters for ADHD are about arousal and uh, motivation, so noradrenaline and dopamine are implicated there as well. Okay, now a third condition to consider is anxious attachment. And as the name suggests, this is all about mood instability and the desire to form a close pair bond with somebody else and intense anxiety about the potential loss of that pair bond. Now, there is actually good evidence for an association between anxious attachment and limerence. There's a strong correlation. So in a survey of limerence that I carried out in the general population, around 50 to 60 percent of people have experienced the symptoms of limerence. But if you just look at people that have an anxious attachment style, they report an incidence of limerence of 79 percent. So there's clearly a strong correlation between anxious attachment and limerence. Now the origin of anxious attachment within the brain lies in the past. It's in that developmental process of the bonding system and the arousal system in particular. And that regulation happens in early infancy. So in the first few months of life, so this is pre-verbal, and it's really about the bonding interaction between the infant and their mother. And really it's about the synchronization between mother and baby in terms of arousal and the kind of pacing of emotions. To compare anxious attachment directly to limerence, so the primary symptoms here are about bonding anxiety and comfort seeking, so getting the regulation of arousal from another person. Bonding between mother and child helps them to learn to regulate their emotions effectively and to regulate their arousal effectively. So obviously this is a big topic uh, to cover, but you could summarize anxious attachment as being, if you like, excessive negative arousal. So in contrast to ADHD, which is all about, if you like, the upstate of excitement and distractibility, negative arousal can be thought of as anxiety, stress, concern. The subcortical brain regions involved appear to be the cingulate cortex and the amygdala, which is an important part of the limbic system that helps us regulate fear. And the primary transmitters for anxious attachment, again, because it's arousal, noradrenaline is the central transmitter, but also the hormone or neuropeptide oxytocin is going to be very important in anxious attachment. So an important point to make at this stage is that all of us have these traits. 
So we very naturally in our sensitivity to anxiety or our worry about the strength of a pair bond or our ability to, to focus our attention on a task that needs to be done. So this might just be normal variation or it might be neurodiversity. It may not be all the way to a clinical condition that needs treatment and needs management. So there is a possibility of over-diagnosing here and that we should recognise that because these systems regulate so many of our emotions and our behavioural drives and these systems are vulnerable to instability, there's bound to be some overlap. Another consideration is that although there may be a link between limerence and these other conditions, that link may not actually lie within the structure of the brain and the operation of the neural system. You very often see what's called a comorbidity between one mental health condition and addiction. So often excessive use of alcohol or drugs can be a coping strategy that people use to self-medicate. Now, if my argument that limerence is a behavioural addiction holds, again, this could just be a coping strategy that people have used to regulate other mental health conditions that they're needing to manage. So it's always very hard to disentangle what is causation versus what is correlation. And I think that helps highlight how any individual person is going to experience limerence within the context of their own life. So their personality type, their personal history, if they have any of these other conditions, is going to determine how the limerence experience progresses for them. So people with anxious attachments may get those symptoms of limerence linked to that intense fear of loss about the pair bond and the intense drive to form that pair bond. Limerence with ADHD might be very prone to distraction and intrusive thoughts and a strong motivation uh, to seek reward. Limerence with OCD may struggle with the obsessive intrusive thoughts and constantly worrying about uh, the strength of the relationship with their limerent object. So how limerence manifests for you will depend on whether you have any instabilities in these key neural systems, but also the experiences that you've had throughout your life. Okay, so hopefully that's helped clarify the similarities and differences between limerence and those other mental health conditions. As I said, I think the idea that limerence is a behavioural addiction is the best way of understanding it. And in this video, I lay out the evidence for why I think that's right from a neuroscience perspective. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you'd like more and I'll see you next time.